Thank you for standing. You may be seated at this time. We will have a special. about a room without an adult in it. <laughs> no matter uh, with the size. First Corinthians chapter 15. Well, this really is a wonderful uh, day to celebrate Jesus, isn't it? <coughs> I think about the notion, humanly speaking, of Jesus being crucified. I have a lot of thoughts about humans. A lot of thoughts about people, mankind. Jesus came doing 
miracles that proved that he was God. Jesus came fulfilling every prophecy of the scripture required for him to be God. Among those important prophecies was not only the place and the people to whom he would, which he would be born, but that he was born of a virgin which indicated that he was not born of the seed of a man, and so would have been the first man ever born without sin. So he would have been set apart. In spite of his holiness, in spite of the fact that Jesus was God, he was always, the commentary on him was always that he reached out to unworthy people, sinners, Jesus dwelt among sinners, ate among sinners, loved sinners, and in that way must have been unbelievably relatable. In other words, for Jesus to have an interest in you, you needed to be a sinner. That's relatable to everyone. So, when I think of the cross... Think of the outrage of it. Think of the reality that the best thing that ever happened to the world was to finally have a sinless person. What a benefit it would be to have on earth someone who could heal sicknesses and diseases and raise the dead. I don't want to be silly this morning, but I think it's sometimes in the terms of the fable of the goose that laid golden eggs. Every morning there was a golden egg and so they decided to kill the goose to find out to get the eggs out of the goose and then there are no more golden eggs. Now Jesus is not a goose that lays golden eggs. and I, I, I'm not trying to be silly about it either this morning. But wouldn't it be practical to have someone who was eternal, living among mortal men, who healed every person that came to him with sicknesses and diseases and forgave every person's sin? What a wonderful Savior. And so when I think of humanity and the cross, the crucifixion, I think of a couple things. First of all, I think man is despicable. Man is just despicable. And the second thing I think of, and it's wrong, humanly speaking, I think what a waste. What a waste to have someone like Jesus among you and to kill him. When he could do so much for you. And yet, my friend, not a drop of Christ's blood that was shed went to waste. What an incredible Savior. What an incredible Savior that in dying did more than he could in living. Last night with the teenagers we were looking at, we've been going through Romans 6. And we looked at one of the arguments against a believer living in sin. Was that we're dead. Jesus actually physically died for sins that we actually committed. And so He actually gave His life for ours. And so as far as God is concerned regarding sin, those who have trusted Jesus as their Savior are dead to sin. What an accomplishment of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, the resurrection is a great triumph, but the death of Christ is also a great triumph. There are a lot of catchy phrases that people like to say, but my friend, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus are all significant events. And I'd like to look today at a couple of, just two things. I'd like to look from our text today at proofs of the resurrection and I would like to look at practical applications of the resurrection. Now there's some things that prove the resurrection happened and then practical application because it did happen this is how we can live in light of it. So if you'll find 1 Corinthians chapter 15 I'd just like to read the first several verses, verses 1 through 4 this morning and then we'll pray and ask God to help us as we've got quite a bit of material to go through. 
Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And we'll pray. Father, help us this morning as we look at this reality that Jesus Christ is risen. And as we look at, from this text, simple evidences for the resurrection, help us not to overlook the primary application, which is practical application because of the resurrection. And so help us to understand this morning. God, if there be an individual here this morning that the resurrection is meaningless to, please, Father, enlighten. Help us to see the significance of receiving the gospel and being saved by the gospel, which is that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're interested in knowing how to present the gospel in a very, very simple, clear way, uh, in so much so, in such a way that if someone were dependent on you to know that they have eternal life, 1 Corinthians 15 is a good place to study. I recommend for people two passages of Scripture if you want to learn how to present the gospel simply. John chapter 3, where Jesus explains to Nicodemus how to have eternal life. Any person that wants to know that they have eternal life, you could go to John chapter 3, and Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus asked him, how can these things be? How can a person be born twice? And Jesus simply explained that there is spiritual birth and there's physical birth. Everyone's been born physically, but not everyone has been born spiritually. In order to have eternal life, you must be born again. You must be born spiritually. No individual makes a decision about their physical birth. No baby, I know they say, well, baby decided to come today and that sort of thing, but no baby brought himself into the world and really no baby said, you know, on this calendar day, I'll be arriving. The reality of it is it kind of happened to him. At least I can't remember planning my birth. I can remember pretty close to that, but not quite, beyond, not quite to that point. But I know I was born physically. One thing you can do, though, my friend, is you can make a decision about your spiritual birthday. You can make a decision about being born again. Matter of fact, every person who's been physically born is also responsible to make sure that they have been spiritually born again. And the way to do that is what the Bible says the gospel is. Paul here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 said, I delivered the gospel unto you by which you're saved. He said, unless you believed in vain. Believed in vain simply means unless you didn't want to be saved. In other words, you were just pretending to believe or it was, just a, it was just a silly thing to you. But if you want to be born again, it's something that you can do by faith. And Paul said simply that the gospel is that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again according to the Scriptures. Almost every week, sometimes almost every day, I get emails from people wanting me to help them to know for sure they're born again. This last week, uh, some individuals were emailing me. One in particular was asking a lot of questions about, okay, I don't know for sure when it was that I was saved. Is it okay if I pray and ask God to save me at a later date if I don't know, you know, if I understood well? And then a follow-up question that someone sent to me this last week by email about salvation was, what if I didn't know about the virgin birth when I was born again? Or what if I didn't know everything there is to know about God? Like who Jesus is, that Jesus is God and the Trinity, and all these things before I was born again. Well, my friend, the simple answer to that is that if you believe in Jesus, you just believe the whole thing. Amen. You don't have to know everything there is to know about God to say, okay, God, I believe everything there is about you. You understand what I'm saying? You say, well, pastor, could a person, would a person be denying the Trinity if he didn't know about it? My friend, if you believe that Jesus is God, then He had to be born of a virgin whether you know it or not. If you believe that Jesus is God, then He has to be God whether you understand the doctrine of the Godhead or not. See, Jesus is who He is. And a person can in very, very simple faith understand that God came, was, came to earth as a man 
and He lived a life without sin, and He died for sin, and He was buried, and He rose again. And the Gospel, simply put, is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Those three elements. If you don't have the death of Jesus, then the reason that He died has no... Uh, then, then the reason Jesus came has no purpose. If you don't have the burial of Jesus or the resurrection, you have an incomplete Gospel. But the Gospel simply put, as Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he said the Gospel is Jesus died, Jesus was buried, and Jesus rose again, and you believed it, and I believed it, and we're saved. Do you know that's so simple many people overlook it? That is so simple many people don't receive it. So simple many people think, but you have to do good works. But you have to uh, go to church. But you have to. And people have all kinds of things that they think are the Gospel. No, the Gospel is that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again, and you have to believe it. And if you're here this morning, listen, I'm not advising you to tune me out right now, but if that's what you need, get it. And you'll have gotten enough today. Because you can believe in Jesus. You can know Jesus is your Savior by accepting Him. You say, Pastor, well, how can I know for sure that Jesus is God? Or, it didn't happen in my lifetime. I didn't see Jesus with my very eyes. So how can I know it's true that Jesus came? Well, <laughs> you remember that song we sang today? He lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He's living uh, no matter what men may say. I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. Uh, and then it talks about how do, you, how do I know that Jesus lives? Well, He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. You ask me how I know He lives? He lives within my heart. In other words, Jesus lives in me. Christ in us. Listen, you don't come to the place of having Jesus Christ living in you without receiving Him by faith. But if you receive Him by faith, my friend, He will live in you. And that will be real. Now, you say, Pastor, is that the only evidence of the resurrection? I wish you could have been in Sunday school this morning, adult Sunday school. Uh, Brother Charlie talk, talked about how a person is an unbeliever by faith, and a person is a believer by faith. Faith is required for both both decisions. To not believe in Jesus requires faith. To believe in Jesus requires faith. But what evidence is there of the resurrection? Well, I'm not going to go into all the physical evidences that could be offered today. I'm going to simply state some things that you could receive by faith because I don't have the time today to prove it to you. I will say this, you can test anything. You can test anything that has to do with whether or not Jesus lived and walked on this earth. You can read the sources of Jesus Christ's day and try to determine whether or not He lived and was sinless. You can challenge the resurrection and try to find a grave that has the body of Jesus still in it. And my friend, you'll find that the simple answer to those things was that Jesus actually did live. That Jesus actually did uh, live sinlessly. And that Jesus actually did die, was buried and rose again from the dead. And history corroborates that. As we read our text in Matthew this morning, do you remember what they said when they went to Pilate and asked for a watch to be set over the grave? They said, He said He's going to be, after three days, He's going to rise again. And they said, If the disciples steal the body of Jesus away, then... The second error, quote, will be worse than the first. In other words, as unstoppable of an influence as Jesus was when He was alive, if He comes back from the grave, they'll never stop Him. If you study the Acts of the Apostles in the early church and how that the Apostles were foundational gifts to establish the church, one of the things that you uh, can read between the lines and actually see is that the council that crucified Jesus was scared to death to kill anyone after that. It's amazing the boldness of Peter and John when they said to the very council that crucified had a mock trial and manipulated for the Son of God to be crucified. You talk about individuals with no conscience, with audacity, unbounded. And Peter and John said to them, we ought to obey God rather than men to that same council. And you ask the question, where did Peter and John get the audacity to say something like that to that council? Because of the resurrection! 
See, they killed Jesus and He came back from the dead. You want to try killing anyone else? <laughs> hey, God, Jesus said before He went to the cross, He said, don't fear the people that are able to harm the, the body. He said, you'll be afraid of the person who is able to destroy both the body and the soul in hell. Fear God because of the resurrection. See, my friend, you think, well, I can just go through this life and I can live how I please and I'll just go to the grave and I'll cease to exist. No, my friend, you cannot cease to exist because of the resurrection. And you will stand before God. Or you'll bow before God in a place called hell or you'll be with God forever in eternity in heaven because of the resurrection. Because of the resurrection is significant. It's the most significant thing that ever happened in the world. And you look at the beginnings of the early church, and my friend, I'll tell you, some people that believed in the resurrection was the very council that crucified the Lord Jesus. As a matter of fact, those same individuals, many of them became believers. It took them a long time before they killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. They were afraid to kill anybody after that because of the power of the resurrection. Proofs of the resurrection. Well, let's look at our text this morning. I, I just want to give you some that are in the text. Not all the proofs that we could look at. Uh, there's an inexhaustible list. I don't have, I do not have the scope in my mind. I just don't have the intellectual capacity to be able to cover all of the aspects of the resurrection. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it in a lifetime, and I for certain could not do it in 30 or 45 minutes of preaching on Sunday morning. Well, I can show you what's in 1 Corinthians 15 this morning, and it's enough. It's enough for you. Verse 5, the Bible says, speaking of the resurrection, actually, yeah, that he was um, seen of Cephas and uh, then of the twelve. Now, in verse 5, specifically, uh, the two Marys that came to the tomb of Jesus who would have been the first ones to see Jesus, they're not used as witnesses to corroborate the, the resurrection because Cephas was Peter, who was an apostle that the church at Corinth would have known and recognized this guy, this guy's an apostle. He has credibility. So Paul is not here overlooking Mary and Mary who are there at the tomb. He's not overlooking anybody and not mentioning them. He's not, it's not, he's not trying to get who was the first person to see the resurrected Jesus. And we know it was uh, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were the first individuals to see the resurrection of Jesus. But you remember when they went and told Peter and John? And what did Peter and John do? They went running to the grave, and uh, then Peter, uh, John got there first, but Peter went in first. And he saw that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. Then the disciples went into Galilee. We saw in our account of the Scripture this morning, and they saw the resurrected Savior. Thomas, who said, I have to see it to believe it, saw it and believed it. And so here we see that a witness of the resurrection was Peter. Now you say, Pastor, what's so significant about Peter? He was a follower of Jesus. Now Peter was a follower of Jesus, but if you will think of the time contemporaneous to the crucifixion, Peter was also a denier of Jesus. He knew that Jesus was Christ the Son of God, and yet He said, I don't know Him at the cross. But my friend, the resurrection converted Peter. The resurrection changed Peter and his mindset. And he had the boldness on the day of Pentecost to preach probably the greatest sermon that's in the Bible on the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Never has a sermon been more eloquently preached and more effectively preached through the power of the Holy Ghost. You say, Pastor, what about the Sermon on the Mount? Well, the Sermon on the Mount is actually a Jesus teaching His disciples. It wasn't the Gospel. Peter preached the Gospel on the day of Pentecost and thousands came, came to Jesus Christ. And so Peter is a good evidence that there's a resurrection. A guy who denied the Lord Jesus powerfully proclaiming Him to the very individuals who crucified Him and said, This same Jesus whom ye crucified, God hath made Him both Lord and Christ. He is alive. So Peter is used in 1 Corinthians 15 as a proof of the resurrection. Prior to that is a greater witness. And this isn't the message that I'm preaching uh, this morning, but if you look at chapter 15 and verse 3, 
uh, there are two statements made in verse 3 and verse 4. They're made twice. And it's the second part of verse 3. How that Christ died for our sins. Notice that next phrase. According to the Scriptures. Verse 4. That He was buried, that He rose again the third day. Notice, according to the Scriptures. The second proof, the second witness of the resurrection is the Scripture. The Word of God. The Word of God prophesied when Jesus would come, and the Word of God prophesied when Jesus would be cut off. Literally, in Daniel chapter 9, not only the coming of the Savior was specifically prophesied to the day, but the crucifixion of the Savior was also prophesied. That's incredible, isn't it? Jesus Christ died for our sins, the Bible says, according to the Scriptures. So proofs of the resurrection, the Word of God. Listen, my friend, let me just simply challenge you with something. Be intellectually honest, will you please? I have talked to so many individuals who are in unbelief about the resurrection and they're so intellectually dishonest. They're so intellectually dishonest. First of all, a person who begins with the supposition, I will not believe, is not being honest. Because no matter what the facts are, that person will not believe no matter what. You say, well, pastor, no one's really like that. No intellectual is actually that close-minded. Well, actually, a lot of people are that close-minded. And you know many close-minded people, actually. You ever met somebody that believes something no matter what? Somebody ever believed something about you that was untrue? Just, just think back to junior high if you can't. You ever have someone believe something about you that was untrue, and no amount of evidence... No amount of evidence affected what they believed because they decided what they wanted to believe. You know, if you don't like somebody, you're usually not very honest about them, are you? I mean, nothing a person that you dislike, nothing a person you dislike that they can do will be actually done with the right motive to you. Isn't that true? You don't like the person, it doesn't matter what they do. If they, you know, if they give you 50 bucks, it, we, you know what they're really trying to do? You know, why they, you know why they gave me 50 bucks? They, they're acting like they're my friend, but I'll tell you what they really are doing. No, that's the way we are when we don't want to believe, isn't it? And I want to just tell you, a person regarding the Scriptures who has never read the Scriptures and never been open to the Scriptures is not intellectually honest. I don't know how many people have said, well, the Bible has mistakes in it, and I just turn my Bible around like this and I say, show me! They can't show me. They've never read it. They never. And then they'll they'll Google. You know, Google's handy nowadays. Uh, okay, Google, where are the mistakes in the Bible? And then they listen to what somebody says, and they never check to find out if it's actually true. Siri, by the way, doesn't know. Google does. Okay. Uh, the reality of it is, a person's not intellectually honest if they've never read this book. You're here this morning and you say, well, I don't know if salvation is as simple as you say it is this morning. Well, my friend, the reason you don't know is because you've never, never read the book. And the Scriptures are what tells us about the resurrection. You'll be amazed how reading the Scripture will convince you of the resurrection. I don't even know how many people I know, but many people I know who have been born again, who have come to Christ came to a point in their life when they got intellectually honest enough to say, well, I'm going to read the Bible. And they usually will go to the Gospel of John. And I've met people who said, you know, by the time I read through the Gospel of John one time, first time I read through the Gospel of John, by the time I read through it, I, I believed in Jesus. I've met other people who said, I just read it over and over and over and over again. I couldn't understand what it meant when it said in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made, and Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and so on. But all of a sudden, reading the Word of God, all of a sudden the light turned on. And the willingness to believe, my friend, corroborated the Scripture, and the Scripture showed them that Jesus was risen, and that He was God, and that He's the means for eternal life. And so from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning, Jesus, my friend, the resurrection proves that Jesus is God, and the Scriptures actually corroborate that. Isn't it interesting that ultimately Paul, when he has Peter for a witness who's still alive, 
when he has 500 brethren, we'll get to that in a second, who are witnesses and are still alive, isn't it interesting that he actually goes to the Scripture? He said, Jesus is risen according to the Scripture. In other words, he places the evidence or the testimony of the book in a higher, greater importance than Peter, who actually had supernatural ability given by him of God to do miracles. Peter actually did miracles. So did Paul. And they said, the real way you could know that Jesus is risen is the scriptures? Well, that's a pretty, uh, pretty insightful weight of importance that's given to the scripture or the proof of the scripture. Then the multitude saw Jesus risen from the dead. Many saw Jesus. Verse six. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. And so Peter said, five hundred people in the same crowd saw the resurrected Savior. And those witnesses could be corroborated. And except for some of them that were sleeping, most of them were still alive and they had seen the resurrected Christ. So there were witnesses of the resurrection. Uh, in verse 7, Paul said, After that he was seen of James and of all the apostles. And so the apostles were witnesses of the resurrection. And then Paul goes on to give one last instance in verse 8 he said last of all he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time for reference you could study acts chapter 9 for reference you could study a uh, second corinthians chapter 12 and you could look at paul's experience of being an eyewitness of the resurrection of the lord jesus christ and then paul begins to get practical he begins to be very very practical about the resurrection it begins to talk about because Jesus is risen, here's where we go from there. Now, I'm going to make an assumption here today, and it's not probably 100% true, but mostly true. My assumption is that most of you are, are, are uh, believers in the resurrection. That this special day is very special to you because you believe in the resurrection. Most of you today have had a resurrection experience because Jesus Christ is risen. And so... Uh, I'm, in a sense, it, forgive the phrase, preaching to the choir, talking about the resurrection. But I want to get practical for you who have believed in the resurrection for the next several minutes, if you'll permit me. I'm going to look at some practical applications. Will you please go down with me to verse uh, 12? Paul is practically going to share, first of all, some negatives about not believing or negatives if the resurrection isn't true. First of all, verse 12, Paul said, Now if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some among you that there's no resurrection of the dead? Now verse 13, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Now, I don't have time to get into it, but Paul is dealing with a doctrinal problem in the church at Corinth and they're having a discussion about whether or not there's life after death. And now, people really know in their heart that there is somewhere forever, right? You talk about, uh, to most people that aren't believers, that have never heard the gospel, that aren't in any kind of religion, most of the time when I say something like, you know that you're going to be somewhere forever, most people agree with that. It's just innate. God made us knowing that we have an eternal soul. So when you mention that to people, usually they'll say, yes, I agree with that. Now, they may not agree with what the Bible says about it, but God made them knowing that they have an eternal soul. So it's an innate understanding. Well, Paul is dealing with people that are motivated to say that there's no life after death. And Paul here is pointing out to people that have received Jesus as their Savior who believe in the resurrection of Christ, he's pointing out the folly of believing that Jesus is risen, but believing that it doesn't affect us. In other words, Jesus is risen from the dead, but we're still going to die. And Paul's saying that makes no sense at all. Okay, so if Christ is not risen, he said, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Jesus isn't risen. And in verse 14, he said, if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Let me just say this to you. This may be your Sunday. This may be your Sunday to be in the church house. And if Jesus isn't risen, you wasted your Sunday. 
In other words, it may be, it may be that, that you go to church one week out of the year, and I am telling you, if Jesus isn't risen from the dead, you wasted that one week. Life's too short to waste on religion. Do you hear me? Life is too brief to waste on religion. Unless there's a resurrection. And there is. In other words, if Christ is risen, that's all that matters. If Christ is risen, nothing matters. So Paul is saying, your faith is in vain. He goes on to say some other things. Uh, he said uh, that the gospel that we preach to you is false. Verse 15, he said, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that He raised up Christ. He said, so if Jesus is not risen, he said, then we're liars. We won't get into it today, but in different places, Paul alludes to what life was like before he believed in Jesus and what life was like for him after believing in Jesus. And believe you me, Paul did not profit by the gospel. He wasn't like the lying apostles, quote, of today who get Bentleys and Rolls Royces and Jumbo Jets because of the way that they abused the gospel. Paul got rocks in the face. Paul got fists in the face. Paul got robbed. Paul was beaten. Paul was defamed. Paul was imprisoned. Paul was ultimately killed because of the resurrection. And my friend, if the resurrection didn't happen, he was the greatest fool there ever was. If he didn't have a bodily, out-of-the-body experience and see the resurrected Christ, my friend, Paul was the greatest fool there ever was. Because physically, as far as this world is concerned, he and the other apostles lost everything and gained nothing from the gospel if there's no resurrection. But there is a resurrection. Amen. So the negative aspect, Paul said, we're nothing but liars. Just don't follow liars. If Jesus isn't risen, it's a lie. It's just religion. It's fake. It's phony. And it's a waste of your time. Paul said as well, he said, if Jesus Christ is not, isn't risen, he said, you're yet in your sins. Verse 17, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. If Jesus isn't risen, my friend, you've still got a sin problem. You say, Pastor, but I'm a good person. You know, your good works have nothing to do with your sin. And God never forgets a single sin. God doesn't have some kind of scale or balance where He equals out this good for that bad. And if the good outweighs the bad, my friend, there's no way. God has a law that says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And if there's no resurrection, my friend, the verdict stands. The wages of sin is death. And so you've got a death problem. You've got a sin problem that's a death problem. And you'll die in your sin if there's no resurrection. Well, that's the negative application. It's another negative application. Paul went on to say some more things about the resurrection. He said, gospel preachers are false witnesses of God. He said, you still have a sin problem. And then he said, you'll never see your loved ones again. Look at verse 18. Verse 18, he said, then they also which have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. He said, your loved ones aren't somewhere forever. If there's no resurrection, they're gone forever. You know, I don't know how many people have told me, even when they don't believe in the resurrection, they've said, you know, I just believe they're still with us. Well, my friend, that isn't true. They're somewhere forever. Those that sleep are either with Christ or they're separated forever from Christ. But what a comfort it is to know that loved ones are with Christ. I'm, 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 I'm running out of time this morning, but I want to just tell you really quickly. One of the... One of the greatest opportunities I ever had to preach the gospel was at a funeral of a wicked man who I believe was born again. The man was so wicked that literally his children were wicked. And they had no connection to anybody of that would even go to church. And so they knew somebody that knew me. And they called me and asked if I preach his funeral. And I went to their home and they're in complete despair because they're wicked and their father was wicked. And as far as they know, they believed in God. But they, as far as they know, their dad's in hell. 
And I said, do you have a Bible? Do you have a Bible? And they went and got a Bible. And I just wanted to share the gospel with them so they could know how they could be saved. And I opened his Bible to John chapter 3. And the man's name was signed next to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I looked at it and I said, guys, there's some good news here. I went to 1 John chapter 5. And where the Bible talked about he that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed. And where it talked about, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Oh man, I'm about to misquote the scripture. Anyway, he signed his name in 1 John chapter 5 when the scripture talks about assurance. He had his name signed in both, and I thought, here's hope. They never had a funeral before. Never had anyone they knew die. And I said, what do you want, what do you want the funeral to be? They said, we've never been to a funeral. We want you to do everything. We're just going to come. Never met the man before. That's kind of an awkward thing. <laughs> so I planned his funeral. We started by opening up, and there were he was a popular guy. There were about 400 people there. He was known for big parties that he would throw. And everybody in the town pretty much knew him. He was very well known. And there were just a, just a real crowd. I mean, it was a funeral home. The, the room seated about 200. And so they opened up a side room overflow, and they had about 50 people in there, and there were people standing down the hallway, and just people standing in the aisles. It was standing room only. I've never, been, never preached to as packed a crowd as that. And I opened it up for anybody who wanted to to share memories about this individual who was a wicked man. His brother was the first one up. And he got up and he said, you know, the first time I ever rode in a stolen car was with this guy. And then he said, the second time I rode in a stolen car was with this guy. A girl got up and she, she was probably in her uh, mid-30s and she said, yeah, when we were teenagers he used to buy us beer. And then, I mean, just one story after another, like 45 minutes of revolvery. Just wicked stories. Wicked story after wicked story after wicked story. And everybody's hee-hawing and laughing and trying to be happy. When everybody got done, I stood next to his grave. I had his Bible in my hand, not next to his grave, next to his casket. And I just looked at the casket and I said, how many of you believe this guy's in heaven? And you could hear a pin drop in that crowd, believe you me. You could feel the daggers they were shooting at me. It's like, we know he's in hell, and you didn't have to say it. We didn't come here today to hear that. Not a single person in that room raised their hand thinking this man was in heaven. And I said, I do. I think he's in heaven, and I want to tell you why. And I preached the gospel of the resurrection. Never seen so many hands raised in my life of people that wanted to receive the gospel. And my friend, I just want to tell you this morning, because of the resurrection, wicked people can be in heaven. And... The reason that that's a wonderful truth is because there are any kind of people but those kind of people. We are wicked people. When we were yet without strength, the Bible says in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And the resurrection is everything. And Paul simply said, he said, if there's no resurrection, he said, then your loved ones are gone. And you'll never see them again. You'll never hold them again. You'll never speak to them again. And my friend, perhaps the thing that has been the greatest comfort in my life, that I haven't lost anyone who sleeps in Jesus, would be snatched away if there's no resurrection. I look forward to one day seeing so many loved ones. Boy, I could give you a list. Whenever I have memories of lost loved ones, I just think I can't wait to see them again. My friend, if there's no resurrection, that is fake. That's good for nothing. Thank God for the resurrection. Amen. Paul said without the resurrection, that's no good. is isn't good for anything. There is a resurrection. Jesus is risen and so are those who sleep in Jesus. I can't wait to see that wicked man and just to hear his, his uh, rejoicing over how that... The fact that he received the Gospel was instrumental in many people coming to Jesus. Last year I had the privilege of uh, leading my 100-year-old great-aunt to the Lord three weeks before she died. And getting to preach the message that she wanted me to, to family at her funeral and seeing about ten people get, come to Jesus Christ. And I think, man, she wasted a hundred years and yet because of the resurrection she's alive and because of the fact that she believed in Jesus, 
about ten people in our family did as well, and they're alive forever. All the resurrection has massive implications. Last thing I want to see in the negative is if there is no resurrection, practically speaking. The Bible says in verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. I don't have to get specific to tell you that we live in a world that is full of tragedy. People are asking why about all the things that happen every time they turn on the news and they look at the evil that's in the heart of men and the despair and the fact that people have no reason to even live. And my friend, the reason for it is because they don't know about the resurrection. That's the answer. What's wrong with the kids today? What's wrong with the adults today? My friend, what's wrong with them is they don't know about the resurrection. And it has massive implications. Paul said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. Why is there so much misery in the world? How can someone who knows Jesus go through so much and have so much joy while someone who seemingly has nothing wrong lives every day miserably. Well, my friend, because of what they believe about the resurrection, I want to tell you, if there's no resurrection, they're right. Life is miserable. There's no reason to live. There's no good existence. Thank God for the resurrection. See, the resurrection has practical implications for even how we live in this life. Isn't it so? If in this life, well, only we have hope in Christ, or of all men, most miserable if there's no resurrection, there really is no hope. But on the positive side of things, I want to look at a couple of things. First of all, Jesus is risen. Verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Jesus is risen. That's the positive of it. And because He's risen, He reigns. Verse 25. For He must reign till He hath put all enemies under His feet. And my friend, for those that know that Jesus Christ is risen, the evil in this world is only something that's temporary. The evil in this world is only something of that... God has very, very well handled and has managed. God is not out of control because of the resurrection. Evil is not going to triumph because of the resurrection. Jesus will reign and He's going to put His enemies under His feet. You say, Pastor, when I look at the world around us, I just see wickedness, I just see evil, and I see nothing good in it. Well, my friend, then you're overlooking the good thing, which is the resurrection. And because of the resurrection, Jesus Christ will reign and He will put His enemies under His feet. Listen, my friend, sin is defeated because of the resurrection. That's pretty positive, isn't it? Amen. You could make it because of the resurrection. You have made it if you're born again because of the resurrection. There's more things in this passage that I could mention, but death is doomed because of the resurrection. Verse 54, so when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall have been put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Hey, how does death triumph over a person who is resurrected from the dead? Where is the triumph in death? Where is the triumph of the grave for a person whom the grave cannot hold? The grave is swallowed up in victory. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of the resurrection, you and I can have victory over death, victory over sin, victory over the grave. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And what better way to conclude the implications of the resurrection than to say living for Jesus matters forever because of the resurrection. Huh. Nothing that's done in this life for a risen Savior is insignificant, is going to be forgotten. Everything that's done in this life for the risen Savior, my friend, has eternal implications because of the resurrection. And now when we meditate on those truths, let me tell you, living becomes practical. How we live for Jesus becomes very, very practical, doesn't it? 
I couldn't begin to delve into your life and tell you how practical the resurrection is for you. But if you'll take the time and just simply ask the question because of the resurrection, how should I then live? My friend, there are easy answers. Should I live as though there is no hope? Should I live as though there's misery in this life? Should I live as though there's victory of, the, in, of death? In death, as though there's victory in the grave, as though grave has a victory? Or should I live victorious over death in the grave and sin? How should I serve Jesus if there's a resurrection? What ought to be a priority in my life? If my labor is not in vain in the Lord, how much ought I then to labor for the Lord? Do you see the whole difference in perspective because of the resurrection? Maybe you're not there. Maybe you'd say, Pastor, if the gospel is that Jesus died, buried, and was rose again, that's a step I haven't gotten past yet. That whole believing in Jesus and being born again or being saved by the gospel, which is the death, the burial, and the resurrection, I haven't done that yet. Well, my friend, that's your first step, and after that, everything else matters. Here today, though, and you say, well, you know, the only thing that matters is if you're saved. No, my friend, the resurrection matters far beyond the moment of your salvation. It matters from that moment forever because you're alive forever. Father, thank You for what You've taught us today in the Scripture. And God, it would be our privilege if You would just move in our hearts and give us specific ways individually that we could respond to the truth that we've heard. So now I ask that you bless them with an invitation. Before we uh, have a time of invitation in our service, and I'll explain more about that in just a minute, I'd like to ask everyone to just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed just for a minute before we have our invitation. And the reason for that is I'd like to have everyone here to be able to have a, a quiet, mo private moment where no one's looking on you and no one would think anything about you or judge you. I'd like to ask the first question. The first most practical question would be this. You're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor, I hear a lot of words. I, I understand concepts. But the resurrection has never been personal to me. I've never been risen with Christ. I, I've never been saved, as you use the word, or born again, or I don't know that Jesus is my Savior. I actually believe I'm open to the idea that Jesus was risen from the dead and that He died for my sin, but it's never been practical enough for me to receive it. But God's talked to me about that today. I wouldn't want you to call me out or embarrass me. But Pastor, God's speaking to me about this matter of eternal life. Would you pray for me? If that's you here this morning, uh, without, without looking up or looking around, just slip your hand up. I'll see it. And right when I see it, you can slip it back down. Pastor, pray for me. God's talking to me about this matter of eternal life. Okay? Slip it right back down. All right? The second group that's here today, and that would be those that have believed. Here this morning, and you'd say, Pastor, you know the resurrection has not been personal enough, personal enough for me to understand the practical implications of it. But you know, 1 Corinthians 15 kind of did that for me today. First of all, my faith has been strengthened by some just simple reasons given in the Word of God. And the scripture's been enough for me today. God's shown me some areas in my life, reasons that I have to think differently than I have. God has shown me some areas in my life, ways that I have to live differently than I have. And God's speaking to me right now. And don't call me out, don't embarrass me, but God's doing the work, and I'd like you to pray for me. Would you just slip your hand up? God's doing work. You have to slip them right back down. Slip them right back down. Okay? Because of the resurrection. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have an invitation. We're going to, in just a minute, I'm going to finish my prayer, and we'll open up to page 251. But uh, before we do that, I want to finish my prayer, and then I want to ask that you would just respond by telling God what you've told me. And I'll be a witness of that here this morning. Father, thank you for the way that you've spoken to individuals, showing them either need for eternal life or showing individuals this morning the need to live differently in light of the reality of the resurrection. And I just ask you to bless and move now in the invitation we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. If you're physically able to do so this morning, I'd like to ask that you would open up to page 251 
in your hymn books. And I want to ask Brother Tosh to come and to finish out the invitation. We're going to have a baptism here in just a minute, and I need to prepare for that. Uh, but I want to ask Brother Tosh to come. And as we sing this song of invitation, you could just respond. The way that God has spoken to you, you could just respond to Him uh, by telling Him what you've asked me to be a witness of and pray for you for. Okay? So the invitation is very simple. Maybe instead of singing, you just remain in your seat or bow your head while others sing and uh, just do business with God as He's spoken to your heart. Almost persuaded. Be sure to stick around. We will have a baptism here pretty soon. Outside of that, you are dismissed. <laughs>